Good evening and welcome to episode 24 of Down on the Corner, the flagship show of Kinder's Corner. I'm your host, Mark Roseman. Tonight, our guest is a man who already had a successful baseball career before game six of the 1986 Mets Red Sox World Series made him one of the most iconic figures in Met history. The ball that went between Bill Buckner's legs at first base was the play that turned the entire series and the team morale around for the Mets. The 1986 Mets have forever been loved for their swagger, their attitude. In a team filled with larger than life characters such as Keith Hernandez, Doc Gooden, Daryl Strawberry, and Lenny Dykstra, he is still one of the most beloved and revered Mets to this day. It is a pleasure to man to welcome the man we all know and love as Mookie, the one and only Mookie Wilson to the corner. Welcome, Mookie. Hey, man. Thanks for having me, man. Great introduction, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so obviously, I, I, I say this every week, but these guys are, are so good. I don't really need to say it. just a quick reminder. I'll start the show off with some questions for Mookie. Then afterwards, uh, while we're doing that, we ask that you keep yourself muted. Afterwards, you guys will get the chance to ask Mookie questions with the raised hand feature, or you can just do it old school by raising your hand, and you usually ask better questions than I do. So, Mookie, thanks for coming on with us tonight. Believe it or not, I posted a picture of you and I from 1980 back at Shea when I was interviewing you. Wow. Um, it, it just, I, I can't believe how the time has flown. But before we get to your Met days, I want to talk a little bit about a Yankee link that you have. During college, you transferred to play for the University of South Carolina. And even though you had been drafted earlier by the Dodgers, you wanted to better your draft stock by, by going there. Uh, yeah. At that time, former New York Yankee, great Bobby Richardson was the head coach. He resigned. You actually ended up playing for coach June Reigns. How much interaction did you have with Bobby at all? And what did getting to play in a college world series where you lost Arizona two to one, but your name to the all tournament team mean to your development as a player? Oh, well, for, I, I think one of the best moves that I made was um, not signing with the Dodgers. Um, it was when we had a, a supplementary draft back then, they called it the winter draft. Um, and they drafted me. Uh, I was in junior college. I not really knowing a whole lot about baseball. Baseball, I mean, football was not in the plans. Okay. So when I was drafted, that really took me by surprise. So I didn't know, I really didn't know who I was or what kind of ball player I was. I mean, I knew I was a good college player, but um, pro ball just wasn't in the cards. Um, so I turned them down and um, I was lucky enough to get an opportunity to play, you know, for University of South Carolina, which is kind of weird because I tried to go to University of South Carolina my freshman year. <laughs> and um, for some reason they rejected me. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I ended up going back there um, the second time around. And um, Bobby was gone. Bobby Richardson was gone at the time. And Joan Reigns, old Phillies catcher. I think he played for the Phillies, an old Phillies catcher. And, um, you know, I was playing against them in an exhibition game, believe it or not. When I was Spartanburg. We were playing the game called the exhibition game you know, in Carolina. And I was actually pitching against them. <laughs> you know, so, so after, oh, wow. I pitched four, after I pitched four or five innings, um, I went to the outfield. And I played the rest of the game. And, and toward the end of the game, running back from center field, um, I'm close to mound going to my dugout. Um, the sister coach stopped me in the mound, at, you know, as was I interested in coming to South Carolina next year. I said, Oh, <laughs> you really? <laughs> you know, and um, that's how it all turned around, you know. And, and then I, after a couple of weeks, I um, accepted it. And um, the rest is history, man. You know, it was one of the best moves I've made because it really helped me develop as a player. I got to play against um high quality ball players all year long and it really gave me confidence to um to get ready for the next step which i didn't know was going to be a uh, mess of a ball but i knew i was ready to play at major college so it was one of the great moves for me nice as this show obviously is a tribute to kiner's corner show it's always great to have guys on who actually yeah. appeared on the original with ralph kiner uh we do have one of the episodes that you appeared in, in 1984 a uh, game which you went four for four in up on our site tell us about what you recall about being on kiner's corner and with ralph it was always fun to, to go to ralph you know uh, ralph had the unique way of number one mispronouncing your name <laughs> but um, it, it was kind of funny because I really didn't know a lot about Ralph and, and until I got, you know, with the Mets and then you, you look back at his history and the success that he had as a player and, and, and now he's, um, announcing games and I'm, I'm sitting there talking to him. 
wanted to make small talk with him. Around wasn't much for small talk. It was all about baseball, you know, and the game. And I always thought it was one of the highlights of the game because, you know, back early days, we didn't have a whole lot of highlights. So being able to go on Connor's Corner was the fun thing to do. And um, I, I remember thinking, you know, you know, I couldn't remember who Ralph played with, and I, I didn't want to get too involved because I, I felt kind of weird not knowing it. I should have known. We're talking, man, Ralph Kiner. Everybody else knows Ralph Kiner, but Mookie Wilson, man, who was Ralph Kiner? But knowing who he was and, and what his contribution to the game, uh, you want to be able to go toe-to-toe with him and talk about baseball. There's no way you could do it. I just couldn't do that. So it was one of those things where you, you want, hope you had a good game, and that you knew your next step would be on kind of corner. And that, that's what's always fun. So I don't know if you're even aware of this, and that's why it's great to have you on tonight. Yesterday was actually the 42nd anniversary of your first game in the majors in L.A. Um, oh. September, September 2nd, 42 years ago. What yeah. do you recall about the day you were recalled from the International League, where at that point you had led the league in runs, scored, yeah. led the league in hits, led the league in triples, and you had stole 50 bases at that point. How did yeah. you find out you were being called up? And what do you remember about walking into Dodger Stadium and, and seeing your the your jersey up in the stall? Well, I, you know, it was um, it normally the manager call you in after the ball game. Um, I had no idea I was going to be called up. Uh, so at the end of the season, um, the manager, which was Frank Birdie, was the manager, called me in and said, um. You know, the, you you going up? You know, you know the big leagues. I didn't know the Mets were in California. <laughs> I did not know that. So I jumped on the plane. We went to California. Um, I didn't know I was going to play that night. Now, you know, got to the ballpark. Um, went to Joe's office, and Joe said, "You're in the lineup." I was saying, "Whoa, okay, I'm in the lineup." I was about ready for the idol. But once I got to the ball, you know, got on the field, it didn't hit me. I'm playing the Dodgers, man. Steve Garvey, Ron Say, you know, you got Don Sutton over there. You got Richard Smith. You got Dustin Baker. I'm playing the Dodgers. These are people that I just watched on television on the game of the week. And now I'm playing against them looking across the field. I, I think I was more nervous about that than the actual playing the game. I've never nervous played the game. But I was, well, maybe star starstruck would be a better term for it. I was in awe looking across people, watching these guys, man. And um, by the way, I went over the series now, not just the game, I over the yeah. series. And yeah. I think I had a lot to do with it, you know, overcoming that. Um, there's no, I, I just one of the greatest feelings I've ever had. But even at that point yet, I still not believe that. I couldn't say I have arrived. I couldn't say that yet, you know, because um, I, I I hadn't done anything yet, you know. Major League is a big difference from Major League in, in AAA. But I was, it was just a good feeling of being in Dodger Stadium, man, and looking at people. I mean, 30, 40,000 people. I mean, I was playing the start in front of 4,000 people every night. That was easy. But 40,000, that was a different ball of wax, man. <laughs> It's so funny because, I mean, obviously our demographic skews a little older, but it's not you know, hardly anyone in the younger generation, even those kind of corners. So our listeners, our guys on our website, are pretty much my age. And so these younger Met fans are, are so excited about the quote unquote baby Mets, Vientos, Batty, Alvarez, and Mauricio, yeah. all being here at the same time. Now, that same September 2nd, you know, 42 years ago, yeah. not only you were called up, a guy named Yubi Brooks, yes. Wally Backman, yes. Mike Scott, and yep. Ron Berenguer. Yeah. That's a pretty good five. Yeah. Um, but the interesting thing is, even if we were the most rabid Met fans, which we were, in 1979, the only glimpse of Mookie Wilson we might have seen was when the Mets would do the year-end video, and you would say, oh, down in the farm, so-and-so, and you'd see yeah. one Mookie Wilson at bat. Everyone, including us, has seen, if we wanted to, Every single triple A at bat of all four of these guys. How much pressure do you think a young player coming up today is as opposed to when you guys came up back at 42 years ago? I think it's the same pressure. Um, when we got called up and we came up in, you know, 80, the missile man. I mean, the team was just 
it was bad. I don't know if they knew which direction they were going. And it's just like, uh, even in AAA, AA, I was accustomed to winning. We, 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 we were winners. We, we were winners. And I, I thought that by going to the Mets, that we were going to this change that turned that whole thing around, which it didn't happen, not right away. But that was a lot of pressure because you go into Shea Stadium at the time and there was hardly any, anybody, you know, in a bubble. So we thought we took losing as a reflection of the ball players that we were, you know, and um, that's the wrong way to think. So I've been thinking the mess is struggling right now. You bring up, you know, Mauricio, Viento, um, Alvarez, and they have to feel that same urgency to win. And I, you know, so I think the same pressure is there. I mean, granted, this 2023 Mets team is nowhere compared to what the, the 80 team. The 80 team was horrible. I mean, it was just a bad team. But they do have things to work with. And by those guys coming together, I think they can share um, the, the nerve, they can share the story, they can share the anticipation, the expectations. And I think that's going to help them um, a, a lot. And um, I couldn't have said that 42 years ago, but I understand what it means now to have someone to share those days with you and to be there because um, hippie us that, hey, it's not all on your shoulders. It's not all on your shoulders. Um, I, I think this team is a little different from when we ate it because when I come back ate it, it was on our show. <laughs> they play, it really was. We were the players that they were going to be looking for in the future. There was no if, ands, and buts about it. These guys coming up with a mixture because you already have Alonzo up there. You're, you already have McNeil up there. You know, you already have Nemo up there. So you have players there that help you along. So it's a little bit different, but that pressure is still there. It's so funny you say that because in, in speaking to Mark Vientos the other day, in anticipation of Mauricio getting here, he yeah. said he couldn't wait for him to get there because yeah. they've been through the every step of yeah. the way together. And to have them all there was a, a feeling of comfort to him. And it's funny you say that because like I just have this flashback, and I believe Sal was with me that day yeah. of, of sitting there in the corner of the dugout with you and Yubi Brooks in 1981. Yeah. It was probably three quarters of the season through. And you guys were both having terrific years. Yeah. And we we're talking about possible rookie of the year. And yeah. both of you said, well, you know, it's an honor to even be in that same conversation. But and both of you said, but you, you, you called it right. You said Fernando Valenzuela looks like he's going to get it with everything that's going on. But you're right. That was that was the beginning of the turn. And, and you look at what the Mets have done at the trade deadline, acquiring so many high end yeah. prospects. You mentioned Alonzo. All right. We, yeah. we, we talk about the core. You got Alonzo. You got McNeil. You got Lindor. Marte, if he comes back healthy and Nimmo. Um, when you came to the Mets, they did that slow build, all right? Yeah. And first, you know, you guys come up, then they trade for Keith, then they bring up Straw while yeah. you're there, then they bring up Dwight and Ronnie, then they trade Yubi for the kid. Uh, yeah. It took a while, and I think Met fans now are a little more of a quick fix. Like, we, we you know, after yeah. 101 season, 101 win season, we don't want to take a back step. But you take a look at the foundational pieces. I see Batty and Vientos in some roles, but I can see one of them being spun off down the road when they're close for a missing peach, maybe an arm. What was it like for you to see that slow build, you know, 85, the success, and then finally that 86 team? And, you know, it was, even though it was a slow process, it's a process that we saw coming. Um, like I say, in the 80s, we were, we were bad. We were losing games with no chance or even winning. We were just out of ball games. Um, but after the 81 season, 82, particularly 83, we were still losing games, but you didn't feel like you were losing. You felt like you had a chance. You know, we were still losing, but wasn't losing by the first inning, you know. <laughs> and and that's, the, that's the feeling that we had then. Uh, these guys, I don't think have, they, they know they have a chance to win when they go out there. Um, you know, it's is toward the end of the season, but because of the nucleus that's already there, that gives them an, an, an upper hand on them. We didn't have, we knew every guy on that team was not going to be on that team the next year. 
we knew that. It didn't take a genius to figure that out. It, 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 it just a matter of what time they're going to go. Um, and as we got closer and closer, um, you could see the team starting to take shape and we start to feel really, really good about ourselves, you know, and stuff of that nature. Um, and you mentioned the interesting thing about maybe one of those guys being put in a package to bring in a more important piece. We got Keith and we saw some players, you know, um, to set Lewis for Keith, okay? But those players weren't part of the future anyway. You know, I, you know, they just, they weren't part. They were good players. You know, you had, uh, what, um, Neil yeah, Allen. Allen and Rick yeah. Yeah. yeah, yes. You know, those guys weren't playing with some part of the future. Hubie was though, but, Hubie but that was, was the missing, right, right. But Hubie that was the missing was. piece. And I think that's the one that hit me the hardest because you and I had yeah. been through it together. We, we yeah. we've been we've been roommates since we signed. Yeah. You know, we've been roommates and and we 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 did a lot of things together and we shared that same um expectations. Huey was the number one pick. I was the number two pick. And but we played against each other in college. So we had that little thing going anyway. Then we just they had this bond. And um Vientos, I can see how Mauricio Viento I can compare the relationship probably to Huey and ours. And um, as the way, I would love to see those two guys, you know, came together and continue together. Uh, the atmosphere, uh, the environment of baseball today, you just don't know. You, you don't know what that piece is going to, they're going to need. And sometimes um, that missing piece come expensive. Um, Huey was an expensive player. Huey was a very, very good player, you know. Yeah, but great clubhouse um, guy too. Oh, he's, he's super. I mean, yep. you know, he's a brother, and you know, but uh, we needed that catcher, and that was more important at the time. So that's good. Yeah. So it's also interesting because Davey Johnson set the bar so high that year. He yeah. he not only told the team, he told the world yes. that not only are the Mets going to win, but they're going to dominate. You yeah. know, um, the Mets won 101 <laughs> games last year. Yeah, but it didn't translate into the same swagger that you guys, no. the '86 Mets, have. I don't think any team ever has come no. close to that. And I love Buck, and I, you know, but I know that Buck would never ever put it no. out there in the press that his team is gonna win from wire to wire. Is he? He'll he'll temper expectations. Yeah. Um, is that more a product of the fact now social media you don't want other teams to have but like do you think with social media back in the day if it existed in 1986 and there was twitter that davy would have been as vocal with saying that the mets were going to dominate and and and, and put, i mean did that push you guys i mean did that motivate you to back up his words and do you think any manager could do that today well first of all i you know when davy said that i say to myself are you crazy <laughs> Why would you do that? You know, but, and because no matter how good you think you are, anything can go haywire. You, you know, there's baseball. That's why they call it baseball. You know, um, because, uh, but the one thing that we did have, um, and, and David was the perfect guy for that team. David had a, uh, a touch of arrogance about him himself, you know, and I, I think that he knew that there was a, there's nothing you could have said that would affect that team. It, that team was that arrogant. That team was that cocky. Whatever term you want to use, that team was it. And it didn't matter what other people thought because that team, they were comfortable who they were. You know, they knew who they were. They knew the ball players they were. They knew what it took to beat them. And they also knew what it took for us to win. And I, people use the word chemistry, just throw it around and not really understand what chemistry is. You know, chemistry is simply when one player, or all players respect the ability of the other player to do his job. That's it. That's it. And that team had confidence in no matter who we put on the field, that they were going to do their job. And David had that same confidence in the players. So when he said that, you know, um, no one said a word about it, you know. I thought it, <laughs> but I didn't say it. Why would you even say it? I, I believe that we're going to win, but don't tell people that. Now you say that, well, Buck may not be, you can't imagine say that today. See, 
you can only be disappointed if you have expectations. When you say something like that, you have raised the expectations. So you're setting yourself up for disappointment. Anything short of what you say is going to be a disappointment. Right. And people today try to shield themselves from that. You know, even though they may think it, they're not going to say it say because it. when you say it, you build expectations. And expectations sometimes is a tough thing to live with, to live up to. Um, but we had played the year before and we knew what we had. And every player on that team, we had a one common goal. We had one motivating factor that was beat the set loose cards. <laughs> That's what we figured. That was it. That was yep. it. You told any man, it was like, we got to be set loose. Forget about the Cubs, forget about the Reds, forget about everybody else. It was all about beating St. Louis. And when we did that, it was just, you know, that was, that was just ice on the cake, everything else. So it's so awesome that you say, you know, when he said that, it's baseball, and that's why I call it baseball. And as much as he said that bar high, yeah. regular season, you guys absolutely did. Yeah. You, but yeah. you guys overcame so much as a team. The epic game six against the Astros. To yes. stay, you know, people don't real. I mean, we, we, we'll we'll get to game six of the World Series, but yeah. people don't realize how important game six against the Astros oh. were to stave off having to face Mike Scott in the game seven. Yeah. You guys are down three nothing in the top of the ninth in Houston. Yeah. You're in the middle of it. You know, <laughs> Lenny Dykstra triples to lead off against Nepper. Yeah. You single to, to bring Lenny in to cut it three to one. Then with one out, Keith doubles to score you. And then, you know, Nepper's night's done in favor of, of, of Smith, who walks Carter and Straw. Ray Knight hits a sacrifice fly to tie up the game. And then the epic, you know, that epic, you know, extra <laughs> inning game, which was just yeah. phenomenal. I mean, I, you, yeah. you, if you were walking in the streets of New York, you saw people outside back in yeah. the day when they had televisions in yeah. front of like J&R music. You know, people triple, you know, four people deep watching that game and just riveted because it was, a. It, again, it was an afternoon game, which we don't see a lot of now. People were leaving work and either had it on the radio and then yeah. people were in Penn Station. I, I, I remember yeah. it vividly. What do you recall, you know, after the game's tied, the seven extra innings? Yeah. And what do you remember most about when Jesse Orozco strikes out Kevin Bass with, believe it or not, the tying run and winning runs on base? Yeah. Well, first of all, and you're right. I, I think that people forget about that series. Yeah. And going into that series, we knew Houston was the one team that we did. I won't say fear, but we didn't fear, but we knew that they matched up well with us. If you look at the pitching, they had power, they had speed, they had a, a totally complete team and there were mirror images of what we were and they always say a tough thing in the world to do is to beat yourself you know a tough thing to do is to beat yourself you know and that series I think showed just how close we were as 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 team um going into that series I knew that it was going to be a tough series I didn't predict that game sick gonna be like it was it's all right <laughs> um but I knew it's gonna be a tough because you know, of their personnel. But um, when that game was going back and forth, it was so mentally draining that my chest was actually hurting. <laughs> because, you know, you're going back and forth. It's one of those games where you say, someone win it so we can just go home and start fresh tomorrow. I mean, this is how intense that game was. And um, even to the last out, man, they were right there again. I mean, come on. Come and um, Jesse getting the last out. Um, it was just like just relief off everyone because thank God we don't have to face Mike Scott because you know look this game it, it is mentally challenging enough but when you have to face a guy who was a Cy Young, he had a Cy Young year. That's their number one pitcher and. Um, you just don't beat up on the number one pitchers, you know. Not saying he can't be beat, but he had done. He pitched against us pretty well. He had done pretty well yeah. against us, and um, it wasn't the most comforting thing in the world. And 
to be all honest with you, there are some guys who are already in think tank already about place of my Scott. Place of my Scott. We did not want to get to my Scott for that very reason. You know. Absolutely. Um, that's the only time you could probably see a crack <laughs> in the Mets arm. <laughs> It so it's a, it's a it's amazing that it's you know Mike Scott obviously that year was a magical year but to say you know that's a guy you fear when that staff also had Nolan Ryan yeah was still a pretty good oh, pitcher yeah. at that oh, point oh, yeah. No, no question. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it was unbelievable so uh, interestingly enough uh, you know guys who have listened to my radio show um, for a long time know that um, you know uh, I took a break from media for a little while um, nineteen from, I guess, 1983 to 90-something. I had season tickets. <laughs> had season yeah. tickets for the, the Mets in 86. And obviously, you know, yeah. game six, yeah. I'm there. But, you know, wow. my late father, may he rest in peace, all right? Whenever we would go to a game, you know, when I was younger, he was a guy that used to have to get up at 5 a.m. to go to work. But my father had an unbelievable knack of knowing whenever a game was over. It could be the second inning and the score could be two nothing. He said, all right, let's go. No one's scoring any more games. And as a nine-year-old, <laughs> 10 year old, you, you know, you yeah. listen to your dad and, and believe it or not up until 1977 or 76, he was always right. We were at the Yankee world, the Yankee Kansas city Royal game um, game five of the American league championship series. Yankees are losing. Uh, Yankees are winning six, three. We had tickets to the world series. He goes, Let, let's go. This game's over. You know, we, we got tickets to the world series. We're somewhere on the Cross Island Parkway when George Brett hits a three-run homer to tie uh, it up. Yeah. And we're home to see Chris Shambliss walk off home run that sends the Yankees back to their first World Series in X amount of years. We're sitting at game six. And in the, <laughs> in, in the night, he goes, come on, this game's over. I said, I'm not leaving. He goes, this game's <laughs> over. I go, not with this team, it's not. I said, the Yankees, I didn't really care, but I am not leaving. Yeah, One out. He goes, come on, let's go. I go, I'm not leaving. You want to go? I don't care. I'll, I'll hitchhike home. I don't care. I'm not leaving. <laughs> Two outs. He goes, do you really want to watch the Red Sox win and yeah. watch them have the championship? As he says that, I see, you know, what was it? But Marty Barrett named MVP yeah. flash on the scoreboard. Yeah. And he goes, he goes, look. And I go, I'm not effing leaving. Right. <laughs> so obviously I didn't leave. He didn't leave, whatever. But walk me through what you're feeling, right? As those first two outs are made, yeah. you know, now, like you said, you know, Davey put it out there. Now you guys are one out away yeah. from not reaching your goal. What's that first feeling first when two outs are there? What, what's going through your head? Well, you know, I, I wasn't too concerned um, because we had two of our best on-base guys at Atlanta. We had Wally and Keith. So if you want to start an inning, no better two guys to start anything with while they keep. That was great. But when both of them made out, and I'm saying to myself, man, we done blew it. We we blew this thing. We 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 blew this thing. And if you look at the pay, I look at this a, a lot of times and look at the faces of Davy, Mel Sarmine. Mel, yeah, Mel is, yeah, yeah. You know, you know, um, and they probably was thinking the same thing I was thinking. It, look, we had it and we we blew it. And but before before I go, there, I, I always look back. Okay, how do we get to where? I think that w once we beat Houston, I think we took Boston for granted. I, I really believe that we said well, we don't we don't beat the elephant in the room. We don't beat the team that could match it with. They're done. We got them. We got the mother guys, whoever they were. We didn't care about Boston. But anyway, but we kind of walked into it and they kind of bum rushed us, you know. And game six, when they scored those runs, we we went over there and we took games, so we kind of took momentum back. But then when they scored um early, I mean like they did, and we fell down and down those runs, and the first two guys makes out. Um, things didn't look good, and we were pretty much getting ready to flash MVPs and congratulations on the board as ourselves. But then things started to happen. Um, Gary gets two strikes. Okay. No, he gets hit. All right, big deal. We're still down two runs. You know. Then Kevin Mitchell gets two strikes. He gets a hit. Okay. We got two guys on, two outs. 
we got red light. And he gets two strikes. Okay. Two guys get hit after two strikes. What you say the third guy getting hit? You know, things are not very really looking very good. But then he gets a hit. Scores one. You know. I'm in another world at this point. And I gotta change the way I'm thinking real fast. Cause I didn't think I was supposed to be hitting anyway. So all of a sudden now I gotta <laughs> hit. I have to hit and I gotta I gotta change to all right, okay. Go up here. You see the situations, whatever you do, don't strike out, man. Whatever you do, don't strike. If you hit the ball, make the out, okay, don't strike out. I wasn't thinking about, you know, don't make the last out. That was, a, and people say, well, I just didn't want to make the last Of course, I did want to make the last out. I don't want to make the first out. But I, <laughs> <laughs> I want to make the last out. And um, I got two quick strikes on me. Man, I, I tell you, I'm in a think tank right now. And Stanley had already, you had faced Stanley yeah. twice, I think, before that. He got yes. you out both times also in this yeah. series as well, right? Yeah. Yeah, but I would have rather faced Kevin Sorality than Stanley. They know, honestly. I felt that I understood. I knew what Kevin was going to do. I knew what he was going to do. I, you know, and whether I'd been successful or not, but it was a matter of comfort. I knew. Kevin, I played with Kevin. I played with Kevin. Kevin was a teammate. Right. So I, I knew him very well. You know, but um, when Stanley came in and, and uh, got two strikes on me, um, then now uh, I'm okay. I got to start cheating now. Mm -hmm. I know what he's going to try to do now, a little synchro way up. And I'm actually kind of diving. Not, I'm not stepping, but I'm looking out there. Um, get the two strikes and I'm saying anything close, man. Anything close, you swing it. Don't even think about taking anything close. He could do one eight foot off the plate. If I could have reached out, I would be swinging that. That's just very cool. Um, the wild pitch. Hmm. You have no idea the relief when you <laughs> do the wild pitch. You had no idea of the relief. Whatever happened after that, it was just, I was playing with house money, man. You know, I could do no wrong in that, in that situation. And um, the pressure was off. And um, I'm just swinging now, you know, not trying to hit any particular plays. I'm not cheating. I'm just saying if he throws anywhere, I'm going to put it in play. And um, when I hit the ball, I had a really good pitch to hit. This was, People don't say I had a good pitch, a pitch that I love to hit. Middle end, about knee high. Perfect pitch for me to hit. I mean, that was my zone. And I rolled over. And when I hit it, I say some things I shouldn't have said. All right. Let's, we'll just leave it like that. All right. We, you know, I, <laughs> I say some things I shouldn't have said because it was a good pitch for me to really do some damage with. I had two pitches to hit. The very first that I swung at was a perfect good pitch. They kind of hit right left field, you know, left center. That's my pitch. But when that pitch came in there and I missed it, man, that really – that really balls because I should I could have done some damage with that pitch. But anyway, I rolled over it and the ball was hit so slow. It took, like it took forever. So I got to run now. Ain't nothing left to do but run. So I'm running, 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 running. And as I see the ball go through his legs, believe it or not, the thing I said, I wasn't going to say again, I said it again. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it was the most surprising thing I have ever experienced in my life first of all you know people say you had 10 pitch at bat i sometimes i go a whole week and only see 10 pitches i saw 10 pitches that went at bat that was, everything was so unlike me the only thing that was me that you knew was a trademark of me was when i ran i ran mm -hmm. everything even when it was automatic out I, I ran in it for the first time after course they always run everything out after 30 years of playing ball, it paid off. <laughs> so yeah. There you go. I mean, it, it's so funny. And, and like, you know, I, I just remember the fit, the, like being you know, screaming so much, being lightheaded, like for oh. you, like what, what I, I can only, as a fan, the exhilaration for you, when you hit first base and, and yeah. night comes home, what, like you, you talked about that Houston game and feeling yeah. in your chest. How much of a relief was that? Because obviously, you know, you sp I've spoken to every single guy on that team, and they all said, as soon as the, you won that game, you knew that was it. They were done. 
oh, no yeah. matter what, you knew right. they were done. What what went through your mind and, and hearing that crowd just, I mean, erupting? The crowd, the field was shaking and it was so loud you could hear yourself think. People, I'm making a turn going to, I don't know why I'm making a turn going to second base. I have no idea. <laughs> you know, I'm running to second base like, why am I running out here? The game's <laughs> over. And I'm like, so I was either out to one second base and everybody else was celebrating their home plate. I'm, I didn't get in the celebration, you know, because of that. But, um, man, I, you know, after it was all over, I remember going to the clubhouse. And I'm, I'm sitting in my locker and I'm saying, what just happened? I mean, it, there are so many things that happened that, I, you know, you, you couldn't wrap your mind. See, when you're playing baseball, you don't get a full, you don't get the grasp of full pleasure of the moment because you're so wrapped up into what you got to do, you know. But after and I got to see the videos and, and I'm looking at them saying, wow, man, we, we, how do we pull that off? You know, how did we do that? And I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell you something right now. And if you, I can watch that video right now and I know what's going to happen. I know what's going to happen and I still get excited about it. You know, and that's how that, that's that was a moment in in time in history that can never be replaced, can never be duplicated. And talking about it doesn't do it justice. You got to see. It, it's so funny you say that because <laughs> I was there, saw it live. Right, I lived in Fresh Meadows at the time. My dad dropped me off on the way home. Obviously, yeah. the pandemonium and just getting out yeah. of Shea Stadium, getting home. So I probably got home two and a half hours after the game ended. Back in the day, it was Betamax, believe it or not. I, I remember Betamax. <laughs> I, I taped the game, and, and you know, to this day, I, you know, I don't know if I would appreciate it as much if it was another team. But yeah. Vince Scully's call of that yeah. play. And, and subsequently, what happened after that was one of the most amazing things I've ever seen in television because of the moment. So I, I don't know if you guys remember this. And if you have the tape anywhere or they did make the DVD yeah. set, you got to go back and watch it. So they go, you know, they do the play by play. Right. And then after the play by play, I, I believe there was either a malfunction or Vince Scully did this on his own. They go to the series of these flash cuts. They show the Boston Red Sox dugout. And, and you see, you just see Roger Clemens with his head down, McNamara with his yeah. head down. They go to the Mets dugout. They go to fans. They go back to the, the Red Sox. And this yeah. goes on for a minute and 24 seconds. And then after a minute and 24 seconds of just pure silence, the last thing they show is a fan holding up a sign that says NBC. To the end, it says now. The B says Boston. C says choke. Now Boston chokes. <laughs> Vince Scully comes back and says, they say it and, and in the Vince Scully voice. Yeah. I'm going to try to do Vince. I don't do a good Vince. He goes, they say a picture is worth a thousand words. Well, you've just seen a million of them. And they said, <laughs> see you tomorrow night. And that was it. And I've probably watched that tape probably a thousand times. Uh, it, just an amazing moment. Still one of the greatest sports moment in New York history. Um, before we turn it over to the Zoom room, uh, uh, tell me a little bit about now your second calling, which is to provide great taste of your family's tradition of cooking to anyone, anytime, anywhere. You're sharing the experience of enjoying food cooked from recipes passed down from generation to generation yes. of great cooks. How did that come about and what could people expect if, if they have a legacy catered event? Well, it, it came about, um, we've been cooking as a family for ages. You know, uh, what happens, I grew up in a very large family, um, family of 12, 12 kids is in my family. And um, unfortunately, we, the car couldn't hold 12 people all the time. <laughs> so, so whoever was left behind had to cook, you know. And, 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 and my mother was, uh, uh, she cooked for the state, for the schools. That's when they actually cooked the food. It wasn't shipped and then warmed they actually cooked the food fresh every day and she did that for eons for ages and um you know being raised on a farm and cooking for 12 kids and my mother she taught us all how to cook and it just became a passion not just i mean everyone cooks in my family you know my brothers my sisters everyone cooks and um my mother passed away and um we continued to cook for churches uh, we have functions that we have at our church um, to honor our mother and our father, and we feed the congregation, and we, we've cooked for whole towns before. We just, 
we just done it. Um, so recently, uh, my brothers and I have decided that we go on fishing trips every every year together. We just go fishing for two or three days and chill out and, and talk and fish and eat. And we all get into the point where we need to retire. So we say we need to do something to kind of keep us together. And um, we say, well, you know, you know, you know, we we cook, we cook and do all that kind of stuff. We said, well, let's um, we came to enclosure. Let's start a little uh, catering business, you know, that we cook for people, you know. And that's how it all started. And we said, okay, what do we what do we call ourselves? Well, you know, we decided, you know, look, mom calls to cook, and let's try to keep the tradition going. So we're gonna call ourselves Legacy, Legacy nice. Cater. And um, that's how we got started. And what we do is we so we one hundred percent mobile. Uh, we my brothers and I took a, a a trailer, a boat trailer. It's twenty feet long, and we converted it into a kitchen. It's, it's an outdoor kitchen, and we have everything on it. It has twelve thousand square inches of cooking, so we can cook enough food one time to serve three hundred people, very easily, wow. no problem. And um, that's how it all got started, and we. We tell them if you have the location, it doesn't have to be a, a fancy hall. If they have an outdoor place or indoor place, we cook for barbecue, tailgates, um, former dinners. Um, we do it all. And um, so far, it's been outstanding. We enjoy watching people. I never understood my mother. She loved to watch people eat. She enjoyed watching people <laughs> eat. And to this day, um, and we get that same pleasure. And we make sure everything is fresh. We don't use any processed food whatsoever, you know, and we cook and serve. We don't cook and deliver. We cook and serve. And that what makes it a little unique for us. And we, we, we have the time of our lives. And, and it's any, you say anywhere. So, I mean, yeah. where are you guys centrally located? We're centrally located in um, South Carolina right now. Um, but, you know, we go, we Florida, the East Coast. We, you know, Florida, uh, Virginia. And New York, those have been our main stops so far. You know, um, we went, uh, we've been to Syracuse, uh, we've been to um, Norfolk, Virginia, we've been to Hudson Valley, um, down in Florida. So, and of course, City Field. Um, we, matter of fact, we did a an appreciation, customer appreciation in Brooklyn a couple of weeks ago, That's which right. was fantastic. We got an opportunity. And they also give people a chance to meet my family and get a chance to sit down with and just talk and see what we do. It's all about this being connected with the people. And that's something that we've always done. And what well, greater way to connect people is with good taste of food. And we think we can we can provide that. You know, Doug Dickey is gonna get pissed off at me, but but screw Met Fantasy Camp. I think I'm gonna start a fishing trip and legacy <laughs> catering. Yo, know, we'll do that yearly. It's like a lot, lot less painful for us too. All right. Um <laughs> Guys, this is the point where um, I step aside, let you ask the questions that you want to ask Muthi for years. As always, uh, everyone's wow, everyone's doing the technology. They all got their raised hands the the old the, the computer way. So we'll go with Jeff first. So Jeff, go ahead. You're up. Thanks a lot, Mark. Hey, Muthi, how you doing? Hi, doing Jeff. Oh, all righty. Um, you know, I want to talk about you know Astros Game Six. Everybody talks about Game Six, but Game Five. Also went that went twelve innings the day before, and it was I think it was Ryan against Gooden, uh, and I think Gary, I was at the game. So Gary, I remember Gary Carter winning it in, a, in the twelfth out in the twelfth inning. Talk about that game because that that was a pivotal game too. That that was game five. I mean, it can go either way. Well, like I said earlier, um, Houston team was was a mirror image of our of us, and I mean they matched up well. We knew we had our work cut out for us, you know, with that pitcher staff. You know, in the playoffs, if you got two starters in a playoff, you're going to do well. You have two aces, you are going to do well. We had, we just happened to have five. <laughs> <laughs> but they had two very, very good starters. And that's all you need with the days off and the travel days and stuff. Um, but that game uh, with Nolan, it, it was a different feel. Uh, as great as Nolan was, as great as Nolan, Nolan always give you an opportunity to win. He would he always give an opportunity to win. Two things, he wasn't very good at holding runners. You know, I mean, the, the trick was to get on base. Okay, that, 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 that's the trick. <laughs> but once you get on base, he wasn't good at holding runners, so you can kind of take liberties in, in, in that kind of thing. Um, 
and he wasn't what you call a control pitcher. So, uh, and we've had success, you know, against Nolan. I mean, nothing to brag about, but nonetheless, it's success. Um, you know, unlike, you know, Mike Scott, who we had no success with. <laughs> well, not only us, the whole league did. You know, but um, that was a different, but that game was a different feel about that game. And I think players will tell you, it's all about comfort. If you feel comfortable against face, no matter who that pitcher is, if you feel comfortable against that pitcher, your chances of, of, of pulling games out are, are, are dramatically different. Dramatically different. But that was a very, very good game. That series was a great series. I don't know yeah. why people. Oh, yeah. You know. yeah. 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 It's, it's epic. Absolutely yeah. epic. Stevie, you got your hand raised. Go ahead. Buki, how are you, my friend? Hey, my man. What's up, brother? How you doing? <laughs> I'm doing good. Good, good. So I know you, you had talked a little bit about uh, last time I saw you about your relationship uh, with Bill Buckner after yeah. baseball and your friendship with him. I was wondering if you could share some of that with us. Yeah, I, I think that friendships come in a very odd ways a lot of times. Um, I met Bill briefly. Well, I played triple A with his brother, with Jimmy. And when I got, when I was getting played with Jimmy and I was going to get called up, Jimmy said, I'm looking, when you get to New York, make sure you say hello to my brother, which was Bill. I didn't know Bill Button was his brother. I did not know that. And um, I said, okay, Jimmy, no problem. Um, when I met Bill, he was playing first base with the Cubs. And I, I introduced myself, you know, Mookie Wilson, um, your brother told me to tell you hello. You know, Jimmy, he said, well, you know that crazy Jimmy. I said, yeah, I know your brother, you know, and stuff about <laughs> They look could be identical twins. I I was like stunned when I saw Bill. I'm looking like looking in a mirror. But um, after that, I mean, I really didn't know him. I never spoke to him after that. And didn't really see him again until we met him in, in the World Series. I never spoke to him, never saw him again until we met in the World Series. And after game six, we know what happened. Um, after we played Boston, I didn't see him again for three years. Didn't talk to him, didn't see him not for three years. Um, I got traded to Toronto and he was with Kansas City. And we were in Kansas City playing one day. And um, I'm down on the left field line, stretching, getting ready for the game. And then the batting cages for the um, Royals was down the left field line back then. And the home team was coming across the field to go hit. And I'm standing there and I'm, I see Bill. I don't want to talk to the guy that's all the horror stories I heard about him, you know, I didn't want to talk to him. I said, man, I just ruined this guy's life. Now I got to, I don't want to see him. So I'm trying to avoid him running the center field and all this kind of stuff, you know, but something happened. He got delayed and I ended up on the line laying on my back. I was lying on my back and who comes and stands over me with a bat, but Bill Buck. <laughs> and you don't know what went to my mind. All the things that went to my mind by that time. <laughs> And he says, he looks at me standing over me and he says, uh, hey, Mookie, you want to hit me some ground balls? And everything was completely silent. And that was the first words that we exchanged from four years ago up until that point. And from that moment, we became cordial friends. And then um, he retired and I retired and we got together and we decided to go into business together and we got to go to tour speaking, signing autographs. And we became very, very, very close. He would call me in the middle of the night sometime, just talking about fishing, talking about his kids. And um, we just had uh, this beautiful relationship that even though we did some things together, we made it a pact. We say that if they don't want to ask you to do something, Either one of us, we consult the other. We were that close. So we turned down a lot of things because one guy didn't want to do it or whatever. I turned down a lot of things because I didn't want to put him in a position that was uncomfortable. I mean, come on, I was most of the time in New York, I was I was a hero. You know, nobody, you no, know, no one threatened to blow my house up, but that kind of stuff. <laughs> but <laughs> but he was, he was, I didn't I wish people could have gotten to know him better as a person. Forget about the ball game. Because when we spoke and talked, that's all we ever talked about was our personal lives and, 
and how we became such good friends and what our relationship meant to each other. And it was to his very last day, um, it, I was honored. Um, I think when he was diagnosed with his, with his illness, he, he called me two days after he was diagnosed to tell me, you know, and um, I was, I felt good that he felt that kind of relationship with me to share that with me. And um, it was just, it was a beautiful relationship. I, I tell you, I've never been that close to anyone that wasn't a teammate in my life. It's so interesting that that game, you know, that moment, not only for us, uh, becomes so iconic. Obviously, on the other end, Boston, it's really devastating to them. But the way I guess it took some time for him to kind of embrace that. I mean, the Curb Your Enthusiasm episode yes. uh, is just phenomenal. I mean, the fact that he was able to do that just yeah. tells you volumes about the man. And, and he was sick at that point too. And the fact that he did that, it was pretty amazing. It, and it's still, it, it's, it it's holds funny. up to this day. It yeah, does. he is funny, man. Yeah, that when was he amazing. Got that, when he got that opportunity, he called me and asked me, did I want to be on the band? <laughs> I said, Bill. He said, yeah, come on, man. it will be fun. You know, so I got a little cameo appearance there yeah, with, yeah. you know, and, and stuff. Um, but uh, I did because he, asked me to do it and we had the greatest time a lot of the saying they didn't have seen all the things that we did together they only showed that one thing we're walking through the park and throwing people frisbees he threw me keys i drop them and all that kind of stuff <laughs> you know it was really a good time working with him and um he was just a phenomenal being i you know, i gotta tell this one story to, to show you how our relationship our daughters are getting married. Um, his daughter's getting married in uh, August, and my daughter's getting married in September. So he told me about his daughter getting married. I told him, he said, man, I'm good. We're going to be, you know, we're going to be empty pay with the, we're going to, daughters are going, our last daughters. I said, yeah, man, daughters going to be fine, you know. So he told him about his daughter's plans. I told him about my daughter's plans. And something happened to uh, my daughter's, you know, the location that they had to cancel and put it, change the date. So I ended up changing my, well, they did. They changed the date from September to July. So when I told Bill that, he said, man, you just won't let me win nothing with you. You just gotta be first about everything you do. <laughs> and we had a great laugh about that, but just to use that, to the kind of relationship with the kind of person he was, just a, it was just a great relationship. And, um, and I don't mind telling people, um, I miss him. I miss him. I miss him an awful lot because um, that's the guy that we could get together and share and um, just be therapeutic for each other. He was really, really good. So you yeah. just triggered before I go to Sal. You just triggered. You, you mentioned a wedding. Uh, if I remember correctly, um, your wedding was on a baseball field after a game, right? Yeah. No, before the game. Before the game. Before Talk the game. Talk about that. In front of all the fans. Or the front of the fans. Yeah. That's yeah. That. Talk yeah. about that. Well, it was uh, um, my, you know, my wife, we know, uh, South Carolina. And um, my hometown was about eight hours from, you know, Jackson, Mississippi. So I'm playing. Uh, I'm playing. And uh, uh, my what, girlfriend then, you know, she's coming up to visit. Uh, so we decided that, that we were going to get married, um, which I don't know what we were thinking. I'm making no money, you know, and uh, stuff like that. But we we decided we was going to get married. And the GM um, got wind of it. And he said, man, yeah, I've got a great idea. You know, why don't y'all get married in the ball field? Well, we're just going to go down to the courthouse and get married. That's what we're going to do. So, you know, we somehow or another, I said, listen, I didn't got nothing to do with it. You know, talk to Rosa, you know, you know. So he went to Rosa and asked her. And to this day, I don't know what she said, but he came back to me and said, Rosa's good with it. I said, well, she's good with it. I'm good with it, you know. And um, that's how, it, that's how it, so before the game, we played it, I never forget, we played a Little Rock team, St. Louis Cardinals team, by the way. We played a Little Rock <laughs> and they had both, both teams involved and we got married and um uh, that's the only thing i had off too from playing in double a <laughs> but it was good um the club took care of everything which was what you know they the honeymoon whatever that what that's worth but 
Um, they did a nice job. It was fun. It was it was fun, memorable too. It was fun. Good. There you go. All right, Sal, go ahead. Unmute and go. Well, first thing I have to do my hat thing. So this hurts me. He does this every show. <laughs> it hurts me to wear this one. And, um, you're talking about weddings. I missed Game Six. Okay. I got married that day. You got married that day. Okay. I got married that day, and I told everybody if the Mets didn't win that game, it would have been the worst day of my life. <laughs> I know how, how the wife take that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not married. Anymore. <laughs> He's not married anymore. So that <laughs> <laughs> Steve took my thunder. It was uh, exactly what I wanted to know about you and Bill after, because I know you used to do card shows together, yeah. things like that, and sign. Um, did you ever talk about your careers? I mean, yeah. Buckner was so underrated as how yeah. great a ball player he really yeah. was. Yeah, we we talk about that. Matter of fact, we sat down and we watched games together, and we analyzed the game together, and um, we talk about our careers, and we said that it's sad in a way that our careers was defined by one moment. And I, he was really, really, really good player. And I don't think people give him credit how good he was. Um, you know, my career is nothing compared to what his career was. You know, and stat wise, you know, stat wise. And um, he talked about that and how it affected him, um, and how just us being together made it easier. You know, and we would talk about things that we like to do when we played. And we we actually talked about coaching together, you know, um, a couple of times. As a matter of fact, when he got the coaching job in Toronto, he called me and wanted me to come to Toronto and, and coach with him. And I told him, well, it might be a little more difficult than, <laughs> than, than that. But um, but that's the kind of relationship that we did have. And um, we, we talked about, you know, like I said, we talked about the game and how it affected us. And for years, my only people only called me Mookie 86. For years, that's what Mookie 86, Mookie 86, Mookie 86. I also played in 80, 81, 82, 83, 84, and all, all those years. But people don't, and, and I understand it. I understand it. And Bill helped me, helped me to accept what happened. He really did. He said, I mean, he said, Mookie, we're going to be together for the rest of our lives, for the rest of our lives. People are gonna associate us together, so let's embrace it. And I never really thought about that because this comes from a guy who pretty much had to move, you know? And um, I said, oh, you know, okay. And and, and um, it was really, it really helped me because I felt guilty for him, not for me, I felt guilty for him. And um, he can talk me and say, man, why? He said, baseball, things happen, you know. He said, things happen for a reason. And maybe because we being together, us being together, maybe that was the best thing for both of us. I said, all right, okay. So it's interesting you say that because obviously you two are linked. Um, Ralph Branca, who yeah. is uh, Bobby Valentine's uh, father-in-law, was. Yes. He's no longer with us. And Bobby Thompson, they were both still alive, you know, at that period. Did either one of you ever speak to two, the two of them? Because they're always linked you know the the shot heard around the world we never spoke individually with them but we did an event with two of them <laughs> at one point you know and um I, I think i don't know if their relationship was as good as ours you know I, I i don't know um because we never really talked about that um but i did have an opportunity to speak with both of those gentlemen and um i i kind of understand i i knew about the about, you know, the Thompson Branca thing. I, you hear about it, I, but I really didn't understand it until our situation yeah. came up because, and it, you know, it was one, one of those things, sometimes things tied two people together and there's no getting around it. You know, they pretty much embraced it. Um, as to where I was hesitant and Button was hesitant in the beginning of doing the thing, people, people had to talk us into doing these things together. Um, and once they did, we understood that we had more in common than baseball. And it just made, it just, it just was great. But no, we never really actually spoke to each other. 
it's also interesting too because he was such a great player and and it was you know towards the ending of his career McNamara kept him out there as a yeah. tribute to his career because he wanted yeah. him to be on the field to celebrate yeah and, and that that's what McNamara said because th- throughout the entire season Dave Stapleton went in as a defensive replacement in the seventh, eighth, and ninth innings throughout the entire season. And then there was something, I don't know if it's entirely true. They said up until obviously the Cubs have now won a World Series, but they said it was the 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 curse of the Cubs because evidently up until that point, <laughs> no ex-Chicago Cub had ever been on the field clinching. Like no ex-Chicago yeah. Cub had ever, yeah. ever been on a field. So they said it's also a little bit of the Cubs curse. And you've been uh, waiting patiently. Go ahead and unmute. Hey, Mookie, how you doing? Hey, man, how you doing, brother? I'm good, I'm good. So before I ask my question, uh, incidentally, uh, I, I don't know how many people know that uh, Bill Buckner played left field when Hank Aaron hit 715. Mm-hmm. He climbed the fence, and uh, even though Tom House caught the ball in the bullpen, I found out at fantasy camp during the hurricane this past uh November that uh, Buzz Capra was in the bullpen and he would be there and he decided to move somewhere else. So just a little bit of, uh, you know, more nostalgia. Well, the uh, the hippie there, I was actually in Atlanta when that happened. Um, My high school team went to Atlanta to a game because we were, my coach took us to, um, we were camping out and we, they were played, um, we where we getting I think they played Cincinnati the series before, if I'm not mistaken. But anyway, I was in Atlanta when that when all that went down, but uh I didn't know any players and stuff of that nature. But uh yeah, it was a, yeah, Bud Bud was there, Campbell was there. So yeah, yep. he should have yep. been on our team. Yeah, yes, he was. Yeah. Yep. So uh so my question is um in doing reading about the 69 Mets. Mm-hmm. Leon Jones's book, Ed Crane Poole's book, um, a lot of talk about how championship teams are built with platooning. Mm-hmm. And it, it, it made me think about your 86 team and how many guys platooned on your team, including yourself. Yeah. Do you feel that that was an advantage considering how long the season was and how many weapons you guys had? Um, I mean, today's Mets, you know, we're trying to place guys in there every day uh, where you guys a lot of times had two guys. But it, uh, Petunia is is a great tool if you are limited in personnel. We weren't limited in personnel. No. We platoon because that was a way of him getting guys in the game. You know, um, you don't platoon switch hitters too often. <laughs> Hojo, myself, Wally Bagman, you know, switch hitters. You don't platoon guys too often. Um, so it was just a way of getting guys in the game. And I, I tell people this all the time, um, platooning was something that they did, but it, it hurt players like myself. It really did. It hurt players like myself. And you say, well, well, how did it hurt you? I was a natural right-hand hitter, but I learned to hit left-handed. And I think that the numbers will show you that I became a better left-hand hitter. Mm-hmm. But as a platoon player, I don't get, I didn't get to hit left-handed. I only got to hit right-handed. So you're taking the one side that I worked so hard to develop away from me for the sake of getting other guys in the game. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, that my situation probably was unique, but usually when you have a platoon player, you have guys who strictly hit one side, one way or the other. We were different. We were platoon players. We were platoon, but we weren't platoon players, but we accepted the role because it was a way of getting guys in the game. Um, we didn't really like it, but as professionals, you learn to deal with a lot of things you don't really like. Thank awesome. you. All right. Anyone have a last question before we go? All right, Mark. Oh, and, and all right, Mark, go. Meet. Hey, Mookie, how are you? Hi. I'm doing fine. Come on. Hey, my brother, what's up, man? <laughs> I just, <laughs> I got to ask this. Um, 1986 NLCS, Mike Scott scuffing the baseball. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, I mean, Ed, Ed Hearn at camp brought the, uh, brought the balls. He showed us and all that stuff. My question is, I mean, obviously, you know, what did you see on the ball? Number one, number two, was it, did you know anyone or any team, any people around the league that was warning you guys that this guy was throwing this ball that was going zigzag all over the place? Because I mean, you know, I, I, I knew you had, you know, Hubie in, in a Montreal. Yeah. Was it, was there any, any warning that he was doing this for, from a scout on the Mets or no? I, I, I'm just curious. Well, Thank you. Well, um, there is no warning, and we didn't need warning. We've been playing Mike Scott all year. We knew what he was doing. Something. Everybody, everybody. I mean, it was. It was. Everybody knew he was doing something. Um, I can't tell you what he was doing because number one, I didn't want to see the ball. I didn't want to see the ball. I mean, we knew he was doing something. They had the balls. We had dozens of them. Um, <laughs> but here's the problem. If a guy is being suspected of doing something all year long and nothing is done, you're not gonna do anything in the playoffs. Yeah. You can't. You 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 can't. You set yourself up with criticism when you say, okay, all right, see playoffs now. Now we're gonna start checking your ball. No, you can't do it now. So um I didn't expect anything to happen. Even if you had the ball, it could have had a razor mark across the front that wasn't going to do anything because <laughs> it couldn't because they didn't do anything all season long. So I, I, I don't know why people got in such an uproar about it. I understand, you know, um, you know, by giving him an unfair advantage. But, hey, you know, God bless him. Gaylord Perry did it for years. You know, <laughs> different things. So, you know, I mean, listen. If, if you ask any ball player right now, you know, Mike Scott wasn't the only person doing something to the baseball. He wasn't the only person. He was not the only person doing <laughs> something with the baseball. But, um, you know, I, you sometimes you, you you push the envelope to see how far and how far you need, what you get with that edge, man. You you need the edge. I played with Mike Scott. He yeah. needed another pitch. <laughs> he, he needed another pitch. You know, he threw the ball hard enough. Um, but he needed something to differentiate yourself from that fastball that he had or some fastball he threw up in his own anyway. But um, but he became a very good pitcher, a uh, super nice guy, super nice guy. And hey, I'm hey, I ain't mad at him. I ain't mad at him. <laughs> I ain't mad at him. <laughs> Listen, but no, two, we didn't have to advance guy, but but we all knew. Everybody knew we were doing something. Yeah. Two years later, you had a deal with Jay Howell and pine tar on his glove. Yeah, well, I mean, it's just the way it is. You know, yep. I mean, uh, you know, there are little things that people learn to do. Um, but if you don't know how to use it, it does you no good. It does you no good. It's, I, I, I spoke with this one pitcher, and I won't tell his name. And um, he was doing some little say, some un, some illegal stuff. But he only did it when he was on a jam. You know, so he didn't do it just to do it. He did only did it when he really needed <laughs> an out. You know, and uh, I said that makes a lot of sense. But some guys they do it every at bat, every hit, nobody on. They do it. Why? You know, you're up four runs. Why? Save it when you get that game win right there in your hands and stuff like that. Now, see, I'm, I'm. I'm saying like I'm an advocate of cheating. I'm not, but you know, I I got this from a guy who who's successful getting away with it. Pretty good. <laughs> uh, anybody, <laughs> anybody else before we go? I just had a a, a quick question, Mookie. You, know, yeah. you had such a big family uh, growing up. Obviously, it was in the genes for for you and for Preston. But uh, were your other siblings uh, really athletic or oh. get far in sports? You have no idea. There were seven boys in my family. All seven played baseball. All seven of us played under the same high school coach. All right, all seven. Um, and Preston played. And Preston played for the same. Coach and as well. Preston played for the yeah. same high school coach as well. I had two brothers. Um, Philip and John. John actually played for the Mets in Double A. Philip played for the Twins in Triple A. Um, Daniel played in USC Aiken College Bowl, but he was he was too smart. He decided he didn't want to follow baseball, so he went to do some new nuclear reactor operator. That's what he did instead of playing baseball. God bless him. And my other brother Carlos, um, one of the best catchers I've ever seen. Um, he just decided, you know. 
he just wasn't interested in pursuing baseball any farther. Um, all of my brothers played baseball and all of them were terrific baseball players. And I'll flat newsflash, people love to tell me how fast I was. I wasn't the fastest of my brothers by no stretch of the imagination. I was not the fastest. I was not the strongest. I was not the biggest, you know. Um, they just decided that they wanted to go different directions. And I still upset the day because they didn't follow baseball. They, well, baseball just wasn't, it wasn't a career move. It wasn't. It was the thing that we did because we enjoyed it. I just got lucky. Right place, right time, you know. And it just, it just happened. I didn't, didn't plan to play baseball as a career. Ah, I went. But were you the fastest Willie Wilson in baseball? <laughs> Forget about now, your that's a different. That's a different question. <laughs> that's a different question. I, you know, I, um, you know, I, I, you know, honestly, I don't know how fast I was. I wasn't big on timing in how fast I ran in the hundred yard dash or the forty yard you dash. Were, you were stuff. fast, man. The, <laughs> the only thing that mattered to me could I beat the balls in the face. <laughs> that's the only thing that mattered. <laughs> Even when they slowed you down in the the nineteen eighty six Let's Go Mets Go you know, oh, music yeah. video, you yeah. were still fast even in yeah. slow mo, man. <laughs> All right, Mook. As always, man, it's it's so good talking to you. I, I always love it every time we speak. Forty two years later, it's still awesome. Years. It's been yeah. a long time. That long, forty two years. Yeah, it's, man. it's crazy. I'm gonna send you the picture. It's it's nuts. It's like oh. I, I wrote today on Facebook that you know. 42 years ago, you know, Mookie Wilson is still fast <laughs> and, and, you know, and has his hair and I'm, I'm neither now. Ah, <laughs> uh, great. So great guys. Again, always, I uh, love the questions from the zoom room. Um, you know, you guys never fail to impress and it's always great. It, listen, anytime we can talk baseball, it's a good day. And especially speaking oh, to Met Legend. Love All right, Mookie. Baseball. Be good. We'll speak soon. All right. No, thank you, man. Appreciate you guys. We can see a camp I'll week one. Hey, I know. Hey, we Eric. Oh, my brother. <laughs> he's not on tonight. It's just he's it's not me. on tonight. No, he's not oh. on. I'm jokes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's doing stand up somewhere. <laughs> right. 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 All right. All right I'll see you at camp. Okay. Good night, guys. Have a good All one. Right, Have a good night, Take everybody. Care. Thank you. Let's go, Mets, guys. All, All right, right, guys. Bye bye. Bye bye.